Hello, everyone, and welcome to week, week six of Pandemic and Our Changing World. This week, we are really honored to have two speakers with us, um, and they will speak in succession. And so I'll introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. William Felice, who is professor of political science at Eckerd College. Dr. Felice received his PhD from NYU, and he has had a very distinguished career. Um, and I, I'm only going to be able to hit a few of the highlights. He is a trustee on the board of the Carnegie Council for um, Ethics and International Relations, and he has also served as the president of the International Ethics Section of the International Studies Association. In 2006, Dr. Felice was named Florida Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Um, in addition, I should mention that Dr. Felice has received every single award that Eckerd offers for teaching, leadership, and service at our council, at our college, sorry. Um, Professor Felice is the author of five books, including The Global New Deal, uh, Human Rights and Public Goods, which is now in its third edition, authored together with Dr. Diana Fugit, Professor of Economics. You have read a portion of this text for um, today's session, and you'll engage with it during your discussion sections this week as well. Uh, Dr. Felice has also written numerous articles on the theory and practice of human rights for prestigious journals, such as the Cambridge Review of International Affairs, Ethics and International Affairs, Human Rights Quarterly, and many others. Today, he is going to help us think about healthcare and human rights amid our current crisis. So without further ado, Dr. Felice. Uh, thank you, um, Heather, for that, uh, that introduction. Did the PowerPoint come up okay? And it did. Okay, great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today and to talk about the politics and economics of uh, pandemics uh, with uh, uh, Professor uh, Sophie uh, trip. Um, I have 35 minutes and I'm going to just move right along uh, to take advantage of, of this, uh, this time that we have. On uh, my part, uh, part one uh, here, will cover primary health care and pandemic prevention, public health as a human right and global public good. Um, and, we, and then I will analyze the U.S. and global responses to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In part two, um, then Professor Tripp uh, we'll take over and she will uh, discuss the um, false trade-off between addressing the virus and the economy and the class and racial dimensions of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, my part, there are four parts I'm going to go over with you. Uh, part one are key concepts, human rights as a human, the human right to health, second global public goods, and third economic equality. Uh, those are three key building blocks, really, to the presentation. Uh, part two, then, we switch into the United States and the crisis in public health and primary health care that we're facing. Part three, we turn global and look briefly at the World Health Organization and the crisis there. And finally, we conclude swinging back to understanding primary health care and pandemic prevention um, as a human right and global public good. Um, uh, Professor Dean uh, Vincent mentioned uh, that uh, the reading for today was from the, the new third edition of Human Rights and Public Goods. Uh, this is the cover. Uh, so it comes out. Uh, you got a preview, uh, uh, but it's not going to be published until October, so you can look forward to getting it then. And I do want to uh, really credit uh, Professor Diana Fugit, uh, Professor of Economics. She was key to the research, the writing of this entire manuscript, and in particular, uh, the subject we're talking about today, uh, which is the right to health and health as a public good. Well, let's, uh, let's just jump uh, right in then. So again, the first part here are the three key concepts. Uh, and concept number one is healthcare as a, a human right. You know, when you talk about human rights, um, it gets very complicated. And, you know, one exercise I do in my classes is to ask students, because uh, I teach a class on human rights every fall, but I hope some of you take. Uh, but uh, I asked students to write out, well, what is a human right? And it's actually more complicated than you think uh, to write 
that when you think about what, what actually is a human right, where do they come from? What are the claims that can be made? Are they culturally based? Are they Western in essence? And so on. For today, we are going to simply deal with legal rights and, and the human rights that have been affirmed by the international community um, through international law uh, that 190 nations have affirmed uh, these different rights as, as human rights. And so a definition that I, I use around human rights is it's a claim. It's a claim on others to a certain type of treatment and that treatment is for the prevention and alleviation of suffering. Uh, so they're, in this case for today, they're legal claims for the prevention and alleviation of, of suffering. So this is a legal positivist approach to understanding human, human rights. Um, I guess another thing to say, just as an introductory comment here, is that it's important to see human rights as, as social constructions. There's something that we as a human species create. Um, and they evolve over time as suffering changes and suffering, uh, dimensions of suffering change. And so they're not like the Ten Commandments that are engraved in stone, uh, but rather they evolve as new su sources of suffering um, evolve. And so we have seen this um, in, um, then in the evolution of human rights. And so a, 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 uh, a right to health care is now affirmed. Um, uh, by a hundred and some nations. Um, and so what does that entail? It in terms of, as you can see on the screen here, a legal claim. The legal claim is an equal, for equal access to essential and affordable health care. And in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, it states that it's the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, and in the general comments, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, they say health is a fundamental right indispensable for the exercise of all other human rights. Nations who have signed these covenants, including the United States, have signed a number of these treaties, then have the obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill um, the human right uh, to health. Uh, so the human right to health is not the right to be healthy, but it is the right to have equal access to essential and affordable um, health health care. Um, so let's take this a little further um, because um, I think an important other component to understand the human right to health is to see it as, and it's the first line here, um, economic and social rights equal. And this is a quote from Henry Hsu, who's one of a uh, very well-known human rights scholar. And he defines economic and social rights as the morality of the depths, the line beneath which no one should be allowed to sink. And I love that quote, uh, because for economic and social rights, including the right to health, it's not way up here. It's not like open heart surgery that everyone has a right to heart transplant. No, it's the basic, it's the minimum. It's the minimum core obligations that nations have to fulfill uh, to, uh, to, uh, for their citizens if they have signed these, uh, these treaties. And so the argument then from a human rights perspective is that primary health care includes in this minimum core, this morality of the deaths, which is prevention and control of infectious diseases, basic sanitation, immunizations, essential drugs, and the key, this is the key to individuals leading uh, productive, uh, productive lives. So this is then how I, perhaps we can view uh, the right to health in, in, in law and human rights. Key concept number two, we move on to economics. And this is to see healthcare as a global public good. Um, and so this, uh, this chart here is, um, and I'm not sure if you can see my, uh, my pointer, uh, but um, uh, this, this this uh, column here on the right is for non-rivalry, and this bottom column is for non-excludability. You know, when I use these terms in class, students often roll their eyes, and you know, you start using economic terms. It sounds like hard to follow, but these are really simple terms to follow. Um, and so that, that non-rivalry, this column here um, refers to uh, you know those goods uh, that a number of people may enjoy uh, without detracting from the enjoyment 
of others of that good. So non-rivalry, that's, that's the column here um, on the right. This column on the bottom, non-excludability, um, refers, means that no one can be excluded from enjoying that good. So non-rivalry and non-excludability, these make them public good. So think of clean air um, as, a, as an example of this. If I breathe this air, you know, I'm not, I'm not fighting with Heather Vincent over air. You know, it's, it's widely available, it's non-rivalrous, and it's not excludable. I can't exclude it and charge Heather Vincent uh, to breathe that air. It's open, it's not excludable. And so this is a public good as opposed to a private good, which we're not gonna get into today, but some health goods are obviously private goods like pills and syringes that can be excluded, can be rivalrous. Uh, but what I'm going to argue today is that pandemic preparedness and, and, and uh, basic public health are public goods. They're non-rivalrous and they're non-excludable and they bring incredible benefits to all of us if we see them this way. Now, why is this important uh, from an economic point of view? It's important because of something that's called market failure, uh, that um, there's insufficient financial incentives in the market uh, for an individual entrepreneur uh, to, uh, to protect clean air, for example. Since it's available for everyone, there'd be free riders. Everyone could uh, benefit from it from it if someone acts to, pr to protect that air from, uh, from um, environmental degradation and therefore the state has to intervene uh, to protect our air quality and protect our environment overall because it's not excludable, because it's non-rivalrous. So we can come back to this in the, in the question uh, period, uh, but I think if we look at what in economics are called negative externalities and positive externalities, uh, we can see then how primary healthcare really is a global public uh, good. In terms of negative externalities or spillovers, uh, obviously when, when, when healthcare is not provided, there's increased sickness, ill health, huge economic costs, and inability to halt the spread of global pandemic diseases that we are seeing today. On the other hand, when it is provided, when the state plays a role in protecting these public goods, there's positive externalities, which include healthy populations, lower economic costs, open trade relations between countries, and the potential to control uh, pandemic uh, diseases. Overall, when these are protected, there's global improvements in disease risks and lowering of health vulnerabilities. So we have then healthcare as a human rights, we define what that is. We have healthcare as a global public good, we've defined what that is. And finally, the third concept, which I'm gonna spend the least amount of time on because uh, Professor Tripp will be talking more about racial disparities and, and inequalities and the provisions of these, these public goods. But the third key concept I just wanna highlight is this, it's economic equality. Economic equality. Economic equality refers, as it says on the screen, to universal and equal access to public goods, including education, healthy environment, food and water, primary health care, and sanitation and housing. Why is this important? You know, we talk a lot today about inequality and the 1%, and this is a huge problem um, in terms of income inequality and programs to address that need to be met. But that's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is economic equality. Economic equality is different than income equality. Economic equality is simply the morality of the depths. It's the, it's the equal provision of basic education, basic health care, as we've talked about, um, sanitation across the board. And so this is the way, again, to see economic and social human rights. It's this minimum. It's economic equality for all. Well, let's um, uh, move then to, uh, to the United States, uh, part two uh, here in, in this presentation. And the failure really that we're, we see in the US healthcare, healthcare system, you know, every healthcare system in the world right now uh, faced a dilemma, how to keep providing uh, basic healthcare while dealing with this huge uh, pandemic without crushing uh, their economy and so on. And, and unfortunately, the nature of the U.S. health system has made it uh, much more pernicious um, in terms of our ability to, 
to adjust to this pandemic than other countries, as we'll see in other developed countries in particular. Well, why is that the case? Number one, I think it's the case because our healthcare system, primary healthcare in the United States was never set up for all to take advantage of. Um, healthcare for all was never a priority in the United States. And this can be seen, as you can see on the screen, that um, at the time when COVID-19 hits in February and March, there's a lack of access for poor, minorities, and disadvantaged uh, to our healthcare system. Uh, despite Obamacare, 27.5 million Americans were without health insurance um, at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, in addition to that, uh, 164 million with health insurance, had health insurance that was tied to employment, but 34 million of those uh, had no um, sick leave uh, coverage, um, even though they had health insurance while they, were, uh, while they were employed. Now, when we think about the number of people who have now lost their jobs uh, because of the recession, uh, the cut that, that, has, that has taken place, um, one, the estimates now are that one third of the entire working population uh, are now estimated uh, to be out of, uh, out of uh, health, health insurance. Now, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, uh, is now being tested as never before, despite the fact that the Trump administration has taken it to the Supreme Court to try to get it, uh, try to get, get it declared illegal. We need it now more than ever. Uh, but as millions are losing their coverage, um, can they, yes, can they um, turn to Obamacare? Um, 40 million America, Americans have filed for new unemployment claims between mid-March and May 2020. 40% uh, of those lost their health insurance. Could they get it now through the uh, Affordable Care Act? Well, there are some subsidized plans they could apply for. If they're poor, Medicaid they could apply for. If they're young, uh, they could perhaps get on their, uh, their parents' plans. But despite all of those three possibilities, uh, the estimates are uh, that 20% will, will not have to, will not gain health care. Um, at the end of this, um, this period, the uninsured will, will grow in number. And I, I finally should mention in terms of Florida, as you know, we refuse to expand Medicare. So for the, for the poorest of the poor, um, they no longer have um, access to, to um, uh, Medicare because we didn't expand it with the Affordable Care Act when we could have. So we have this huge uninsured population that's expanding. And second, the second problem with the U.S. health system is this, that a for-profit health system really has a lack of prioritization of primary health care and pandemic uh, pre preparedness. And this model, as you can see, has continuously failed uh, the economic distress groups, poor people, racial mi minorities, and other, other disadvantaged um, groups. Uh, hospitals don't have the capacity to deal with pandemics of this nature, to deal with everyone. Uh, and so this pandemic has revealed the vulnerabilities um, in our, our health care system, vulnerabilities, as I mentioned, for the uninsured, racial disparities, and a general lack overall of national planning. Keep in mind that the United States, we spend $3.5 trillion a year on health care. This is more than, I'm gonna list the countries, Japan, Germany, France, China, the United Kingdom, Italy, Canada, Brazil, Spain, and Australia combined. More than all those other countries, we spend more, but yet we lose more people uh, to preventable and treatable medical conditions than any of those countries uh, that I have mentioned. Um, so the healthcare system that we have set up, again, is not set up to serve the most vulnerable, but it's rather serve, it's set up to serve uh, those with money. Uh, it's a for-profit system um, that needs to be adjusted. And so we have this, this bizarre situation that's occurred in the midst of this pandemic that U.S. hospitals across the country have been firing nurses and doctors in the middle of this pandemic because they had to shift resources to deal with COVID-19 
and could not, could not carry out the more profitable elective procedures, and this threw them into uh, financial uh, chaos. Well, what, what can we do um, in, in the United States to, uh, to address the, these issues? Um, I think there are three things uh, that I have, uh, have listed here um, that we, we, can, we can do. Number one is a permanent expansion of intensive care and infectious disease uh, treatment capacities. Germany really is a model of that. Uh, Germany has been able to deal with the uptick of uh, COVID-19 cases. For us to meet uh, with the capabilities that Germany has, we have to triple basically the number of intensive care beds that we currently have and federal funds are critical for that to happen. Number two, uh, mass manufacturing and mobilization of ventilators, drugs, testing capacity and tracing apps. You know, many um, commentators have used the analogy of the World War II mobilization the FDR um, led uh, whereby uh, the government working with, uh, uh, pr with businesses uh, mobilize the, the manufacturing sec sector to technologically advance and dominate Nazi Germany during the war. We need that type of mobilization now uh, to create what we need uh, to take on not just COVID-19, but there will be more viruses of this nature in the, uh, in the um, future. Um, and the private sector alone can't, can't contain COVID-19, the state the federal government has a major role uh, to play. Uh, stopping a pandemic disease is sort of a classic collective action uh, problem. And if you rely on businesses to stop the spread of infectious diseases, I think it's akin to you know, relying on private security to stop terrorism. Um, it just is not adequate. And finally, the third thing is, uh, and something I'll come back to at the end, um, is to see primary health care as a public good and a human right uh, for all Americans. Well, let's move on to um, uh, part three here, which is the crisis in the uh, World Health Organization, the WHO. Uh, the World Health Organization, I think, as you know, was founded in 1948, and it was set up as a UN agency to coordinate and lead the international fight against pandemic diseases such as COVID-19. It is a, quote, technical agency on health. It is to remain non-political. It is located in Geneva, Switzerland, where the other institutions of international organizations of economic and social and cultural concern are located. And the idea was to to insulate these organizations from the high politics of the UN in New York City, uh, where, um, uh, where those uh, political debates take place. The, the, the WHO is not a political organization. It operates by consensus. Uh, what it does is drafts uh, treaties uh, on health and health care, and it drafts binding regulations that nations, by their consent, agree to. These aren't imposed by WHO. Uh, but rather the nations see that it is in their interest to cooperate uh, with, uh, with the World Health Organization on these, uh, on these efforts. Um, and the, the World Health Organization has a, a record of, of uh, dealing with pandemic diseases. In 2003, uh, they dealt with a SARS epidemic. In 2014-16, Ebola. And in 15-16, the Zika. Um, epidemic as, as well. Uh, from at the beginning, because of mistakes made during SARS, uh, the World Health Organization and with the 194 member states by consensus, they rewrote the International Health Regulations, the IHRs, uh, governing uh, pandemic uh, diseases. And the World Health Organization then uh, took, uh, went about reforming their policies and, and they improved uh, their, their ability to deal with pandemics, which was seen then uh, in the way they dealt with uh, Zika and, and Ebola after the mistakes in the SARS, uh, the SARS epidemic. So the new regulations were implemented uh, by the World Health Organization, but uh, they also required member states uh, to develop and maintain minimum capabilities to prevent, detect, and respond uh, to 
uh, disease outbreaks, to pandemics outbreaks. And so what went wrong, uh, what has gone wrong is that the states have not followed through. Uh, that the states, um, the WHO reformed its work, uh, but 15 years after these new international health regulations were, were passed, uh, fewer than half of the nation states uh, are in compliance. Uh, they, many lack even the rudimentary uh, surveillance and laboratory capabilities to fight uh, pandemics. So all the beating up on the World Health Organization, I think is, is mis misplaced. It's like they built a car called the World Health Organization. They drove it, they didn't put gas in the car. And then they, the car runs out of gas. And so they kick the car, like, oh, what a stupid car. This is a bad car. Well, the problem isn't the car. Well, the problem is you didn't put gas in the car. And so that the nation states aren't gonna fall through in their world, their word, uh, then there's no hope really for the World Health Organization's reforms and efforts at pandemic prevention uh, to, to succeed. Well, the Trump administration, um, uh, I should also just mention a record of success up here, uh, which we don't have time to uh, go into because I've only got about nine more minutes here. Um, the Trump, uh, the, the WHO has a great success in terms of immunization programs and smallpox and polio eradication in particular, um, they have been successful at leading uh, the global efforts to eradicate those diseases. But what are the Trump administration's charges against the World Health Organization? I think as we all know, China began as the epicenter um, of uh, COVID-19. The Chinese Communist Party uh, was very slow to report uh, the outbreak of, of the uh, pandemic and they lacked uh, transparency. They resisted help from the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization offered to bring in experts in epidemiology and molecular um, uh, virology. Uh, they resisted that. And, um, and so um, China was slow in reporting. The charge of the Trump administration is that the WHO, the World Health Organization, was basically a co-conspirator, is what the Trump administration is charging. Uh, that in January and February, uh, they said um, the Trump administration is claiming that the WHO um, uh, didn't uh, uh, sort of covered for China and then counter China's, uh, contradict China's claims publicly as they should have, as they should have done. Uh, what those uh, charges miss is, are a number of many things, but uh, first of all, uh, who is not a political organization. They work with nation states. The idea is through constructive engagement, you get nation states to change, who rarely, I can think of only one other time where they've gone public to condemn another country. Um, and so they work behind the scenes uh, to get nation states to come in, into compliance. That's number one. But number two, and more importantly, uh, the Trump administration received reports in, as early as January and February from U.S. representative, U.S. staff working in the World Health Organization, um, giving the Americans um, uh, data on what exactly was happening in China. Number two, Trump administration had from our intelligence agencies a full report on the dimensions of COVID-19 in China. And so it is simply um, not the case uh, that the U.S. was caught unawares until March or whenever Trump finally acted um, and suddenly uh, this conspiracy of who in China um, uh, was uh, blown, the cover was blown and, and now we can act. Uh, that's just simply uh, not true. And I would, I would urge you to think back to Barney, Professor Barney Hartston's presentation to you a couple of weeks ago uh, when he talked about the scapegoating uh, that has taken place in every other pandemic in history and he gave examples of uh, Jewish people being scapegoated for different pandemics at different times. We see the same thing happening here today. Uh, today, uh, these racist uh, attacks on Asians um, uh, coming from the White House uh, uh, are despicable. Um, and then this attack on the World Health Organization is just scapegoating to get out of uh, the responsibilities of the current administration for inaction uh, earlier in this, uh, uh, when this pandemic hit. 
And finally, before we leave the WHO, I, I should point out that if, if the administration follows through on its word, and, and Trump is, has said he's going to not only cut funding, he's going to quit the WTO altogether. We'll see if that happens. Uh, but if the United States withdraws uh, their budget um, of $893 million from the World Health Organization, as you can see on the screen here, that will leave the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation the top agency donor. Uh, the Gates Foundation last year gave 12% of the WHO's budget, uh, about $531 million. Uh, and, and the question uh, to think about, should a rich philanthropist be setting uh, the global health, health agenda? Um, I think that raises all sorts of issues, and perhaps in your sections you can talk about this. Um, we may like Bill Gates, we may think he and Melinda are doing good work, uh, but what if they go in a direction you know, that... Uh, that's, that we disagree with. How can that be controlled without getting the funds cut off? The idea of international organization was more democratic, that all nations would have a vote, all nations would contribute what they could, and collectively over the human, uh, human family, we would decide the direction of these international organizations. Well, what would it mean if we turned this over uh, simply to a rich uh, philanthropist? And I'll, I'll leave that for you to discuss um, in your sections. And finally, in the last couple minutes here, uh, that I have. Um, I want to return then to uh, the theme here, uh, which is that primary health care and protection of infectious diseases are fundamental to human rights and global human, um, uh, global public uh, goods. Well, what concretely does that mean in public policy? Now, what does it mean to implement the morality of the depths? You know, as Henry Xu talks about this line, how do we create this line so that everyone's health is at a basic minimum and that that's protected? Uh, Chilean economist um, Jorge Almuda, um, he argues uh, that for every dollar spent um, in Latin America on doctors and hospitals costs 100 lives. Like, wow, what, what does he mean by that? Every dollar spent on doctors and hospitals costs 100 lives. What he means is that if that dollar had been spent on primary health care, on pandemic prevention, on safe drinking water and so on, then a hundred lives could have been lost. And instead it was invested in prestige, hospitals in Lima and Santiago and so on. And there was no basic morality of the depths, no, no basic health care for all. And this is really linked to John Kenneth Galbraith's ideas for popular consumption criteria famous economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, where he talked about economic investments being organized around, around the basic needs of the poor. And he said the hungry have a special claim on resources. If we look at it that way and think about our healthcare investments serving everyone from all, all aspects of society, the homeless, the marginalized, the poor, the migrants, and so on, the implications for public policy are quite extensive. And I end then with two successes who show this can be done. One a rich country and one a poor country, the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands developed a system in 2006 called Neighborhood Care. And by 2018, this organization had more than 10,000 nurses on 900 teams. They, they were able to go to people's homes, bring basic health care into the, the older adults, people with chronic health conditions, it's a network, a very effective basic network uh, that was then able to adapt to, to um, COVID-19 effectively to help everyone uh, adjust and, and, and get the care they needed. The second example is Rwanda, a smaller country, 12 million people. They've developed a system of 50,000 healthcare workers mobilized throughout the country Initially, they were dealing with HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis, but now they provide home-based healthcare delivery, drugs, benefits, and, and in case of COVID-19, then a network is set up to provide primary healthcare, to provide that morality of the depths uh, for uh, people um, in, in Rwanda to address this disease. Well, thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions at the end. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Dean Vincent. Thank you so much, Dr. Felice. I know that you all have a lot of questions to ask Dr. Felice, but we're going to hold our Q&A period um, all the way until the end. So um, make some notes now. 
and I will introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sophie Tripp. Um, Dr. Tripp is Assistant Professor of Economics at Eckerd. She earned her bachelor's degree from Wagner College in Economics and Spanish, and her PhD in Economics from the Claremont Graduate University. Dr. Tripp is a labor economist who empirically studies the relationship between employers and employees, as well as issues of discrimination and economic inefficiency. She has published on the role that race and gender um, play in the labor market outcomes, such as promotions and job turnovers, job satisfaction, and wages. Her current research and the uh, subject of a forthcoming article focuses on issues of intersectionality and wage gaps, particularly for women of color. She's a member of the Committee on the Status of Women in, in, e in the Economics Profession, and she serves as Eckerd's liaison for this committee. Um, today, Dr. Tripp is going to help us understand how economic inequality is impacting our current situation amid the pandemic. So Professor Tripp, we are so honored to have you with us today. I'm unmuted, right? You guys can hear me? Yes. yes we can. Am I sharing my screen? That's the important part. You are sharing your screen. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Vincent, for having us here today. Um, this seminar has been really important for uh, exchanging scholarly ideas right now. And thank you, Dr. Felice, for getting us started on this topic and making the really important connection to uh, human rights. So he did briefly talk about what I would be discussing. Here's an outline. Um, I'm gonna briefly talk about how economic theory can lend itself to the analysis of pandemics, and then go into a few national indicators, mainly on the current um, employment situation. But really the heart of my presentation is going to be this discussion on the roles of economic inequality. Uh, for you, for one of your readings today, this was the uh, thesis of it, right? There were two main points that were made. First, we're seeing economic inequality determines who is most likely to be medically affected from this virus and who is most likely to be harmed by its economic impact. And the second point of that reading was that economic inequality is directly linked to the severity and longevity of the current recession that we find ourselves in. And then I'm going to end with some concluding thoughts. Um, so if, in case you don't know what economists do, economists study how decision-making units, such as people, firms, the government, make choices under constraint. And constraints come from the fact that we only have so many resources. Now, this is a really broad area of study. So that's why we break economics down into micro and macro. And some of you, um, the students in the audience, are blessed with the requirement of taking both of these introductory classes. Uh, so microeconomics studies the behavior um, and decisions of individuals and firms. And at the heart of it, and this is also kind of what uh, Dr. Felice touched upon, viruses are an issue of what we call negative externalities. And a negative externality is a cost suffered by a third party, and the spread of COVID-19 is a negative externality issue. These, ex these externalities are adverse effects on others that rational, self-interested individuals do not internalize when they go about their personal cost-benefit analysis. So right now, when we're each deciding our level of social and economic activity during this pandemic, as self-interested individuals, we weigh our own risk of becoming infected and the associated costs, ranging from having mild symptoms to potentially dying. But we don't internalize when, they, when we become infected, we impose costs on others by spreading the disease. And it's exactly for this reason that economic theory calls for mandatory public health interventions, such as mandating masks and quarantines to help limit the spread of the virus. And then on the macroeconomic level, macroeconomics is the study of the behavior, decisions, and performance of the economy as a whole. And it's really business cycle theory that allows us to note the ups and downs of an economy 
These are also known as the periods of expansions and contractions and what's causing these periods and when it's cause for concern. And it's the National Bureau of Economic Research that's the official, the official organization that declares when the US economy enters a recession. And a recession is typically defined as a decline in economic activity that lasts more than a few months. But the NBER officially announced on June 8th that the US entered a recession after hitting a peak in February. And this is earlier than usual, but given the depth and broad decline of activity throughout the whole economy, the committee felt comfortable declaring this earlier than usual, really acknowledging the completely unprecedented magnitude of the drop in employment and production. And then the last thing I want to acknowledge is somewhat of an uncomfortable fact for myself and a few others in the audience, and that's the growing mistrust in economics. Um, economists are typically towards the bottom of when it comes to surveys about professions and trust, and we usually escape the very bottom of this list because of politicians. And a great deal of this mistrust comes from a bunch of reasons, but if you wanted to narrow it down, it's from our handling of the last recession, how we tend to dehumanize people into decision-making robots in our models and our undying love of efficiency. So I, I fully understand why we have this level of mistrust. However, one of my goals today is that those of you not familiar with economics or maybe who are familiar, will leave this lecture with a clear understanding of what economics is capable of and hopefully join me in championing what we call messy economics. And messy economics was um, termed by a top economist, Dr. Miriam Bertrand, in a speech from a few years ago. And it's the idea that economics needs to embrace a focus on distributional analysis. So we need to be focusing on measuring inequalities, understanding these causes and then studying solutions. It's not enough that we spend so much time analyzing how to make the economic pie bigger. We need to analyze how is that pie being sliced up and distributed to the people in the economy. So I next wanna to turn to a few misconceptions that are swirling around in conversations right now. And the first misconception is this idea of there being a trade-off between the virus and the economy. And this is a false trade-off. This is um, kind of known as the don't let the cure be worse than the disease phrase going around right now. And this language of trade-offs is being co-opted in completely the wrong way. Prioritizing the medical battle against COVID-19 helps us in the economic battle. This should be the first rule of virus economics. Um, and to further drive this point home, I wanna show you a quote. Here we have, anything that slows the rate of the virus is the best thing you can do for the economy. Even if by conventional measures, it's the bad thing for the economy. And this is from um, Dr. Austin Goolsby. He's an economist at the University of Chicago and also served um, as a chair of the Council of Economic Advisors in the past. But I don't just want to show you a quote, I want to show you even more to convince you of this. I'm going to show you results of a survey. And this survey was taken of 50 economists who are top in the field. They range from Nobel laureates to researchers at elite institutions. The panel also represents the gamut of political views. So we've got Democrats, Republicans, independents. And these 50 economists were asked the following phrase. Abandoning severe lockdowns at a time when the likelihood of a resurgence in infections remains high will lead to greater total economic damage than sustaining the lockdowns to eliminate the resurgence in risk or the risk resurgence. Now they were asked to um, either agree or disagree with this statement. And here are the results. You'll see no one agreed with that statement. 5% were uncertain, but the overwhelming majority agreed. The next misconception that's rolling around right now is this idea of a trade-off between financial assistance and work incentives. And this, this trade-off does come from economic theory that says if we give people assistance when they're unemployed, it will decrease their incentive to find work. But right now, this trade-off is not true given what we're trying to achieve. Um, we, and, and in recent empirical studies as well, it's not holding up. 
the current policy goal is to keep people economically secure until it's safe for them to return to work. The goal is not to create a large amount of new jobs that will increase the spread of the virus. And it's also vital, as you'll see in a few slides, that we need to be providing money during this economic downturn to give families a fighting chance to stay economically stable. And then the last point that I want to make somewhat ties back to the first one. It's this idea that we need to make sure we're keeping the narrative right. The shock to our economy is the pandemic, not the shutdown. Um, and there was a study that was done looking at the 1918 flu by economists at the Federal Reserve and MIT. And they looked at the effects of public health interventions on the size of the economic downturn during this uh, pandemic. And they find that public health interventions reduce disease transmission, duh, without necessarily furthering um, depression of the economic activity in the long run. And they did this by looking across cities that implemented strict interventions and those that did not. So overall, the research is showing the pandemic is the cause of the economic disruption and it's not the policy responses. Okay, so now we're gonna turn very briefly to looking at some national indicators of what our economy looks like right now. Uh, the national unemployment rate in May was 13.3%, and this is down from the 14.7% that we saw in April. The reason it went down is because roughly 2.5 million jobs were added in May as states allowed a limited resumption of economic activity. Um, the unemployment rate, for those of you who don't quite know, it's the percentage of the labor force that's unemployed. And if you have further questions about how it's calculated, we can talk about it in the Q&A. Um, so since February, the unemployment rate and the number of unemployed persons is up 9.8 percentage points and 15.2 million people respectively. So at the end of May, we had a total of 20.9 million people who were unemployed. And I want to urge you all to pay attention because the June numbers are going to come out this Thursday. So I think it would be great. I mean, it's going to be hard to miss. It'll be in the news everywhere. But definitely um, take a look at them and hopefully uh, put them into your discussions on Thursday. Okay, um, another statistic that shows what's going on right now, for 14 weeks in a row, new unemployment insurance claims have topped 1 million. And for the week ending on June 13th, 19.5 million people were still collecting unemployment insurance. Once again, this is slightly down from the peak that we saw in May, but it's still really bad. While we might want to celebrate these small victories in these numbers, if they do happen at all, um, it's equally important to realize the magnitude of them. We went from the lowest level of unemployment in 50 years to the highest level in close to 90 years in a span of two months. And of great concern right now is the fact that research is showing those who are temporarily laid off are going to turn into permanently being unemployed. One study shows that, one study estimates that 42% of people furloughed by this COVID crisis will never get their jobs back, and only 30% of those laid off will land new jobs later this year. So it's really important to put all of these numbers in context. Okay, the next thing I wanna do is share a couple of quotes with you to help us transition into the next part of my lecture. So um, I don't know how many of you are on Instagram or not, but this did make the rounds in uh, media. Madonna posted an Instagram picture of herself, of herself lounging in a bubble bath surrounded by rose petals. And in her long quote, she said the following. That's the thing about COVID-19. It doesn't care about how rich you are, how famous you are, how funny you are, how smart you are, where you live. It's the great equalizer. And what's terrible about it is what's great about it. This could not be farther from the truth. But before we point and laugh at Madonna's naivete, she wasn't the only one perpetuating this. Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York also said back in April that COVID is the great equalizer. Um, and for my young people in the audience, if you don't know who Madonna is, she's a, an award-winning sing singer-songwriter. I don't know my audience too well, I'm, I'm aging out, um, but hopefully you know who she is. 
So I want to show you now another quote that really captures the situation a lot better. Um, Economic inequality in the United States strongly determines who will be most likely to be hospitalized or die from COVID-19 and who will be most harmed by its economic impact. So this was a quote that came from the Joint Economic Committee report titled The Impact of Coronavirus on the Working Poor and People of Color. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn to look at these inequalities to see the data and discuss their impacts during this time um, with a special focus on racial inequalities. While we don't quite have the time to unpack how we got to this point in the US, um, I really hope that this is the starting point for those of you um, that these statistics are new to. So for the students in the audience, I highly recommend you to take courses in economics and sociology and political science, among others, to better understand measurements of inequalities. We're gonna look at three measurements specifically, wealth, income, and healthcare disparities. Uh, there's some confusion usually when I teach this, what's the difference between wealth and income? So I wanna make sure you understand that before we jump right in. Wealth um, is a measure of total assets minus liabilities, or total assets minus debt. Whereas income is money received over some period of time, including wages, interest earned on savings accounts, rents on property, dividends from share of stocks, and a few other things. So you can think of wealth as a stock variable, meaning it's measured at one point in time, and income is more of a flow variable that's measured over an interval of time. Okay, if that's still a little confusing, we can clear it up in Q&A. Okay, this is not shocking, I hope, to you guys, but wealth can help individuals and families weather the storm of an economic crisis. Wealth is the leading indicator of a family's ability to overcome unexpected financial challenges, meaning it's the difference between whether a financial setback, such as a job loss or an unexpected medical bill, is a temporary economic challenge or causes financial ruin. Wealth can buy better health, and the healthy are more likely to become wealthy. So we have this vicious, vicious cycle going on. Wealth allows individuals to take risks and therefore acquire additional wealth, especially the intergenerational transfers that help future generations. So what we're gonna do now is take a look at a couple of figures to really highlight the level of wealth inequality. Um, and then we'll look at a figure that shows this on a racial level as well. Wealth inequality has risen even faster than income inequality over the past decades. Um, and we'll get to the income inequality in a few slides. The wealthiest 10%, which on this graph, um, I realize, I hope you can see the difference between the top one and the top nine. One was supposed to be red and one was supposed to be orange. Um, hopefully you see that. Uh, but you can see that they have taken up and controlled, so to say, 50% of wealth for a long period of time. And one half of Americans with the lowest wealth have 1.2% of the total wealth in the country. And you can see this as the teal sliver right at the very bottom of the graph. And a 2018 study by the Federal Reserve found that nearly 40% of Americans lacked sufficient funds to cover an emergency bill of $400 with cash or an equivalent liquid source. That is a very high amount. One more fun fact, although it's not fun at all, um, in the 12 weeks between March 18th and June 11th, the combined wealth of all US billionaires increased by more than $637 billion. And we have roughly 640 billionaires in, uh, in the US. Okay, now I want to take a look at how does this wealth inequality show up by race and ethnicity. The median Black American family has just over $3,500 in wealth. This is just 2% of the median wealth of a white family, which is roughly 147000 looking at the 2016 statistics. Um, this equates to the median white family having 41 times more wealth than the median black family. I really hope if these numbers are shocking to you right now, you're thinking why. And I'm just going to read you a couple of sentences as to why this is going on, but it's, it is really complex. What it comes down to is the racial wealth gap is the consequence of many decades of racial inequality imposed with 
barriers to wealth. Um, and this comes from the direct prohibition of wealth accumulation seen through slavery and then unequal treatment after emancipation. So just some of these, some of these barriers include legally mandated segregation in schools and housing, discrimination in the labor market, and redlining, which incredibly reduced access to capital in black neighborhoods. And to put this in a little bit more of a historical context, the 2016 racial wealth gap is roughly the same as it was in 1962, two years before the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So what this is saying is over the past 50 years, the distribution of black wealth has not even caught up to the distribution of white wealth in 1962. And one economist who is a leading um, racial scholar, he stated that the racial wealth divide is the number one pre-existing condition that has worsened the severe health and economic impact of the COVID crisis on communities of color. So I really want to make sure you're understanding the severity of these numbers and the implication of them as well. Okay, moving on to the role of income inequality. Rising levels of income inequality have put many workers in vulnerable positions, meaning we have thousands and millions of workers who are having to choose between financial security right now or health security. Workers have lacked the power to share the gains of economic expansion that would have given them protections and security. And the income gap between the rich and everyone else has been growing um, consistently for more than 30 years. And stagnant wages and decreasing workplace benefits have left many families without enough savings to weather the recession, which also showed up with the wealth statistics that we were looking at. And just in case those of you who didn't do the reading, this is referencing the, the reading uh, page numbers from the reading that you had to do. So here we have another figure highlighting the levels of income inequality in the US. The numbers above the bar that you're seeing, um, that indicates the income that puts you in that income group. So if you earn $1,789,000, you're considered in the top 1% of income earners. And over the past five decades, the top 1% of American earners have nearly doubled their share of national income. And this shows, if you do the calculation, um, which I love to do with graphs, the top 1% earns 85 times as much as the bottom 21%. And then when we break this down by race, we see that in 2018, median household income for white households was 70% higher than for black households. This is the difference between the roughly 41,000 and the 70,000. Uh, lower incomes are one of the reason why black families haven't been able to build up savings to weather the storms, such as the one our country faces right now. And then if we look at the bottom half of this figure, it gives us, gives us some uh, insight into the income distribution in regards to the poverty rate. And the black poverty rate is two and a half times the white poverty rate. So what this means is one in five black people in this country live below the poverty line. And the poverty line, the way it's calculated, depends on how many people are in the household and where you live in the country. But for a family of four, the poverty threshold is roughly 26,000. So you can imagine um, job losses for people below the poverty line, it's absolutely devastating. We're going to look at a couple of figures now that highlight who our frontline workers are and who has really the privilege of working from home right now. Um, there are three main groups of workers in the COVID-19 economy right, right now, and those are people who have lost their job and face economic insecurity, those who are classified as essential workers and face this health insecurity as a result, and those who are continuing to work from the safety of their homes. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, less than 30% of workers can work from home, and it, it really differs enormously by race and ethnicity, which you can see here with this figure. As you can see from estimating um, using prior years of data, this figure shows that 19.7% of Black workers have the ability to work from home right now. And then when we look at who our frontline workers are, this, this is a graph that shows um, Black workers as a share of all workers in a given industry. So this shows us that um, Black workers are more likely than others to be in these in this frontline in these frontline jobs. While they make up about one in nine workers overall, 
that's the 11.9% that you can see, they make up one in six of all frontline industry workers. So while those working these jobs are mainly protected from job losses, it's exposing them to a greater likelihood of contracting COVID-19 while working. Okay, the next um, and the, the third and final topic of disparities that I want to bring up are racial disparities in healthcare. Um, I've done my best to kind of compile and I'm going to bring up the main disparities, but in reality, this is a very narrow summary of an incredibly complex topic. In 2018, 15.2% of Black Americans were without health insurance compared to 8.1% of white Americans. And I want to make sure you realize this is prior to job losses. So like Dr. Felice brought up, um, 164 million Americans have their health insurance tied to employment. So we have to figure, factor in how many of those have lost their job and consequently lost their access to health insurance. Decades of research proves that black Americans are systematically undertreated for pain relative to white Americans across all ages, and I should have added as well, across all income groups. And even more disturbingly is that a recent study found evidence that racial disparities in pain assessment are associated with false beliefs about biological differences. These are false beliefs from medical professionals. We also see that black patients are disproportionately treated at healthcare facilities with the fewest technological resources and most poorly trained professionals. And compared to white patients, black patients are referred to see specialists less often. And I won't read the rest, I'll let you guys do it for time purposes, but essentially this is trickling over into all types of medical procedures. And a study that looked at health equity found that the, and what health equity is, in case you're not sure, it's this ability to um, be as healthy as possible, kind of tying back to Dr. Felice's presentation. This has shown little progress. The gap between white Americans and black Americans has shown very little progress. And like I said, this, this really is a very, very narrow list of what the situation currently is. And this is spilled over in terms of how COVID testing has taken place. Reports are showing that at the beginning when we were only giving um, COVID tests to people showing symptoms, the biases shown towards Black Americans spilled over and that they were being denied testing more frequently. And I would be remiss to not mention right now that all of this is built upon the US's history of medical experimentation on Black individuals. So I hope you're wondering right now, Given all of this, you would think we would have been carefully tracking the racial and ethnic compositions surrounding COVID-19 infections right from the beginning, right? Given what I just showed you, seems like a given thing we'd be doing. That is not what was going on. On April 1st, Dr. Ibram X. Endy, Kendi, excuse me, um, who some of you might be familiar with, he's a historian and really the leading voice right now for the current fight for racial justice and equality. He wrote a piece for The Atlantic titled, Why Don't We Know Who the Coronavirus Victims Are? I highly recommend you read this if you haven't um, read it already. But this piece, along with a few others, really um, got the momentum going for states to be held accountable to, to report and um, keep track of the racial and ethnic demographics of our coronavirus victims. So as a result of this piece, Dr. Kendi and his Center for Anti-Racist Research paired up with the COVID tracking project to start calling on these states and counties to report the data. And this led to what's called the COVID Racial Data Tracker, which is a website that tracks race and ethnicity. It launched on April 15th. It's updated twice a week um, and it's fully accessible to the public. So what are, what are we finding now that we're tracking this information? Nationally, black people are dying at a rate nearly two times greater than would be expected based on their population share. And in some states, this rate is three or more times greater. And I just wanna remind you, we, we are at the beginning stages of this pandemic, so this is gonna be changing, right? One fifth of US counties that are majority black account for more than half of both cases and deaths nationally. And then once this racial tracker started going, luckily the CD, CDC did step in and start to track it as well. And they just recently in June released a report finding um, black people have a hospitalization rate approximately five times that of white people. And 
we're seeing this across the, the country right now, other preliminary data is showing incredible racial gaps in access to testing. So um, just want to end on some concluding thoughts. Um, there is a historian, Walter Scheidel, who wrote a book called The Great Leveler. It's about um, the history of inequality. And he said only four forces have led to sustained reduction in inequality. And those four forces are war, revolution, state failure, and pandemic. So we really are in a monumental time in history right now where we can no longer hide behind the falsities of a seemingly strong economy, right? And from your reading, one of the readings this week, um, the authors provided some solutions for how we can come out of this um, recession more quickly, sustainably, and in a more equitable fashion. So we need to recognize that markets cannot perform the work of the government. And this specifically leads to the point that pandemics require political leadership. I will just leave it there. We need to address fragilities in our markets themselves. We can't ignore that healthcare market is not working, among many others, in providing fair access. We need to keep income flowing to all unemployed workers and small businesses and ensure those who are still employed can stay employed. We need to be producing headline economic statistics that represent the well-being of all Americans. Averages don't cut it. We need to dive into those averages and not just produce them, talk about them and use them for our policy making. So the last thing I wanna say is, I do believe economics can provide us with the tools to study pandemics and the health effects and economic effects of them, but it is also important that economists know when to step back and listen to public health officials and scientists. The economy should not be used as an argument for ignoring the science, nor should economists be silent when people tout about the virus as the great equalizer. So I will end it there for Q&A. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Tripp. And um, as we get started on our Q&A, we'll bring up the grid view here.